depends on what you want to compare me to. <laughs> um, thank you for coming out on this, this interesting Thursday morning. Um, so the character of our character, what I want to talk about is that we writers and even more academics tend to erect a harmful and artificial wall between fiction and nonfiction. The convention is that writing, the writing of fiction and the writing of nonfiction are fundamentally different in some mysterious and bedrock sense. I want to dispel that myth, especially with regard to the technique of writing character. Creating a character on the page involves the same basic approach and technique. How do you create a human being with ink and paper? On its face, that's a ridiculous question. You can't. And yet, we try. And some of us actually believe it can be done. We say we've seen it done. So much of what I'm talking about, you already know. It's intuitive. And yet, I might ask, why do we fail? So often, we fail, I fail, we all fail, from time to time, despite the better angels of our nature. I think of Samuel Beckett's famous line, fail, fail again, fail better. I read so many stories and novels every year, and often they fail. They, we all tend to fail when it comes to creating living and breathing characters who are more than an idea, more than an archetype, more than a type, more than a placeholder for a character yet to come. But more, I want to muddy the water and get at the shared tactics and strategies that writers of fiction and nonfiction must use to achieve a similar goal, to create a person on the page with dark squiggles on white paper. In many ways, this is a perverse exercise. It is something only a writer, a dreamer, a head case <laughs> can become obsessed with. In the non-writing world, what my brother would call the real world, it is insane to suggest a real person has any parody with a made up one. But we word pushers know differently. We know that those unsuspecting word and image consumers don't know. We know that in their minds, Madame Bovary, Captain Ahab, Little Orphan Annie, and Atticus Finch, and Sherlock Holmes, and Henry, John Henry, and Anna Karenina, and Dracula are as real as Reince Priebus, <laughs> and Mother Teresa, and Lindsay Lohan, and Hillary Clinton, and Johnny Depp, and Dean Smith, and Jared Kushner assuming Jared Kushner is an actual person. <laughs> and let's not yet touch upon the subject of all those historical figures. George Washington, Hannibal of Carthage, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, Queen Hatshepsut, Julius Caesar, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Banneker, Caligula, Jesus, all of whom have been reinvented in the works of fiction and all of whom are non-scribbling brethren and sisterin consider they've come to know as flesh and blood, but who they come to feel close to via the pens of historians like David McCullum or Robert Graves or Doris Kearns Goodwin or Joe Ellis or Norman Mailer or through the cameras of, or of Ken Burns. So why do so many writers of both fiction and nonfiction fail to capture people on the page? A major culprit, I believe, is a seeming omnipotent an omnipresent image, both moving and still, in our current postmodern culture. No sentient being alive today can escape them. People are even making videos of four cats today. As much as I love pictures and movies, they ultimately spoil us writer folk. A picture paints a thousand words. When I work with students, often it feels as if they are writing screenplays, as if the reader is fully capable of filling in the blanks, painting the picture for him or herself, the sense that our readers have neither the time nor the patience to read description or background or mood. All things that Quentin Tarantino or Steven Spielberg can convey, well done or poorly, in a mere frame or two. But this presumption is a part of the writer. This presumption on the part of the, of the writer is an abdication. The reader is putting himself in our hands, asking us to fill in the blanks to tell us a story in full, not to give us a basic skeleton. We are storytellers, not story outliners. Again, I'm not really telling you anything you don't already know. But I ask again, 
How is a character created? What are the elements that knit together to live in the mind? I have striven to break these elements down into bite-sized pieces, building a character. Physicality, we all have bodies. There is a book I should have put down there, sorry. Um, the Cambridge, the late Cambridge psychoanalyst, psychologist, Anthony Storr wrote a fantastic essay on Churchill. You'll find it in Churchill's Black Dog, Kafka's Mice, and Other Phenomena of the Human Mind. And he, his basic premise is that Churchill was so depressed because he was going against body type. Uh, we know there was ectomorph, endomorph, and mesomorph. That was sort of a theory of physical body types. Ectomorph being tall and skinny, endomorph being pear-shaped, wrong, you know, uh, fat, and mesomorph being, you know, the, the Chris Helmworth types. And uh, Storr's theory was that Churchill was an endomorph pretending to be a mesomorph. <laughs> and he got in trouble so many times for trying to display physical courage that got him damn near killed. And that, that was the source of his depression. Now, the, the psychological community has moved away from that way of thinking. But I defy you to read Storr's fascinating essay, Churchill's Black Dogs, and not see him in that light. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, there's so many elements of the body, the, the fitness and health, eyesight, voice. I was talking with Mark Jarman, Jarman last week about Abraham Lincoln. And um, he was taller than most men in the middle of the 19th century and a rather imposing figure. But he had a high-pitched voice. So it was four score and seven years ago. However, I don't know how to. Um, which is an interesting contradiction. And I, I, I uh, brother uh, 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 Tony Kushner got it right in that movie with the, um, with uh, David uh, uh, Lewis, whatever. Um, David, Day I couldn't think of his name. Daniel Day Lewis, yeah. Um, there is history. Where do we come from? Who are our people? Personally, I hate the term backstory, not just because it is essentially a film term, but because it seems to reduce to the, the core of being to a trick, a filler, a necessary evil. Oh, we need this story to have, a, this character to have a backstory. As if the fact that Abraham Lincoln was born in the log cabin is somehow simply a colorful detail and not integral to understanding who he was, where he came from, and how it has influenced how he sees the world. Uh, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Who were your parents? Who are your friends? Do your choices in friends tell us oodles about you as a character? Your religious background, your education, occupation, significant incidents, failures, successes, disappointments. Personality. What is a personality? How do you define a personality? What is it? Though it is hard to define, we recognize it more by its absence than by breaking it down into its constituent parts. Here are but a few elements that go into making a person's personality, along with and mixed in with the aforementioned elements of characters. Intelligence, likes and dislikes, hobbies and interests, dreams, degree of self-awareness, views of self, political beliefs, cultural and social values, zodiac signs, why not? Taste and care in personal clothing, temper and ways of relating to other people, being introverted or extroverted, do you love relaxation, comfort, and food? Do you, are you assertive or attract or, or active? Is this person private and restrained and reflexive? Is this person, what makes this person strange? Are they hypochondriacal? Do they have compulsions? Do they have obsessions? Do they have fears? What are the inconsistencies of their character? For instance, they want to lose weight, but they raid the refrigerator in the middle of the night. Um, are they devout and yet sex crazed? By this point, most of my students are eyeing me skeptically. All this, frankly, sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> Writing should not be a lot of work, they admit to me. Writing should be fun. I love fun. <laughs> but I think, you know, Le LeBron James, we'd be surprised to know how much time he actually spends on the court we'd be surprised to know how much Michael Phelps, how much time Michael Phelps spends in the water. 
we'd be really surprised to know how much time Simone Dinnerstein spends behind the pianoforte tickling the ivories. So I'm not against work, but this is the sort of character work a writer has to do prior to writing or after drafting. A writer does not trust shortcuts, abbreviations, substitute brand names, and hope by saying Gucci or Eddie Bauer or Lexus that the reader gets it, <laughs> or simply relying on winging it. In a letter to his daughter, Scotty, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, you should learn as much about your character as possible, even though you will probably only use one fourth of what you learn, but the other two thirds matter greatly. The scary truth about prose, fiction and nonfiction is that when it comes to writing, the difference is that there is no difference. Anyone who believes there is a difference in how we approach the actual craft of writing, fiction and craft of nonfiction is suffering under a cloud of illusion. And I have discovered of late that many people suffer from this misconception, but more on that later. I am obsessed with what we used to call the new journalism and have lectured on it and, and, and teach it quite a bit. Um, and who am I talking about? I'm talking about Tom Wolfe, Norman Mailer, Truman Capote, Joan Didion, James Baldwin, Hunter S. Thompson, Willie Morris. Um, they were what was, they were what's happening back in the day. They were brand new. They were psychedelic, up to date, dangerous, with it. They were hotter than Coca-Cola and cooler than Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> Largely, it was hype. And those writers knew that they weren't doing anything new. They were very well educated. Read Hunter S. Thompson's letters to Charles Kuralt and others, and you will find a very deliberate and hardworking writer. He knew how rooted his work was in the hijinks of Lawrence Stern and Tristram Shandy, more than even in James Joyce's Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. In the face of the, in fact, the modernists get, get blamed for a great deal of the new journalist techniques and tactics. I would suggest the roots go much deeper. For Tom Wolfe, I would have us look at Don Miguel Cervantes's Don Quixote. For Joan Didion and James Baldwin, I would point to the father of the essay, that irreverent Senora Montaigne. For Norman Mailer and Truman Capote's outrageous mythologizing, look no farther than Dr. Francois Rabelais and his outsized perversity and distortion and humor and style. In fact, this deliberate confusion of fact and fiction, the use of fictional method methodology to write about factual matters goes back to the very beginning as well. It is our 18th and 20th century need for classification and nomenclature and factual bias that truly created the confusion. Here is my true agenda. The confusion of the real and the actual the characters in both fiction and nonfiction who are based on actual flesh and blood people who become independent entities in their own right, characters who outgrow any measurable actuality and achieve a reality all their own, I think it pays for writers to examine that particular transmogrification. I love that word because it actually means magic. I think it contains an energy we all hope to tap into. I'm particularly interested and fascinated by those characters with roots in historically or journalistically real people, and as my philosophical friends would call, actual people, <laughs> who attain another level of reality as either characters on the page or as fictionalized versions of themselves that outgrow themselves. There is a particular voodoo going on here, and I feel the serious writers takes for granted at his or her peril this process. What we're talking about on a fundamental level is myth making. And I fear too many of us contemporary writers feel that thinking about our characters, whatever their origins or inspirations, as mythological to be grandiose and outside our purview. I would ask you to rethink that self-limiting point of view. Please consider Joseph Mitchell and Robert Penn Warren. Joseph Mil Mitchell was a small town country boy from my home state, went to my university, <laughs> who left early and went to New York to uh, write uh, for newspapers. And um, he wound up writing uh, for the New Yorker during the Great Depression. Robert Penn Warren, the first poet laureate, 
um, not only uh, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, but Pulitzer Prize winning prose writer, novelist. Um, I want to talk about Penn Warren's Willie Stark and Joseph Mitchell's Joe Gould, both based on real people, actual people. Um, when we talk about technique, and it's been said a lot from this very place, we talk about we, the, the axiom is show, don't tell. Um, showing description, dialogue versus exposition. Um, and for some reason, we are more accepting of exposition in nonfiction than we are in fiction. But fiction writers can learn a great deal from nonfiction writers' use of exposition, something nonfiction writers learn from fiction writers in truth. So look at Mitchell's Joe Gould. And this is a, contains a lot of exposition, but also some dialogue, which I think is telling. Joe Gould was an odd and penniless and unemployable little man who came to the city in 1916 and ducked and dodged and held on as hard as he could for over 35 years. He was a member of one of the oldest families in New England. The ghouls were the ghouls, he used to say, when the Cabots and the Lowells were clam diggers. <laughs> he was brought up in a town near Boston in which his father was a leading citizen. And he went to Harvard, as did his father and grandfather before him. But he claimed that until he arrived in New York City, he had always felt out of place. In my hometown, he once wrote, I never felt at home. I stuck out. Even in my own home, I never felt at home. In New York City, especially in Greenwich Village, down among the cranks and the misfits and the one-lungers and the has-beens and the might-have-beens and the would-bees and the never-wills and the God-knows-whats, I have always felt at home. Ghoul looked like a bum and lived like a bum. He wore cast-off clothes, he slept in flop houses, or in the cheapest rooms, in the cheapest hotels. Sometimes he slept in doorways. And later on, he was around five foot four or five and quite thin. He could hardly have weighed more than 90 pounds. He was bareheaded and he carried his head cocked on one side like an English sparrow. His hair was long and he had a bushy beard. There were streaks of dirt on his forehead, obviously from rubbing it with dirty fingers. He was wearing an overcoat that was several sizes too large for him. He, it reached almost to the floor. He held his hands clasped together for warmth. It was a bitter cold day, and the sleeves formed a sort of muff. Despite his beard, the man in the oversized coat, bareheaded and dirty-faced, had something childlike and lost about him. A child who had been up in the attic with other children, trying on grown-ups clothes, and had been tired of the game and wandered off. He stood for a few minutes getting his bearing, and then he came over to Panagakos, the diner owner, and said, I can have something, can I have something to eat now, Harry? I can't wait until tonight. Um, and so the, the description, I mean, and it, it, this is nonfiction, but the, I think the description there um, would fit very nicely into anybody's novel. In fact, I should, I should mention, I should give credit, I'm in this, in this study group back home, um, about Joseph Mitchell, some people trying to sort of resurrect his, uh, his memory in North Carolina. One of the members is Alan Gerganis. And Alan had, did this wonderful in-depth study of, of Mitchell's prose alongside, of all people, Mark Twain. And it's remarkable how much Mitchell learned from the prose of, of Mark Twain. So, uh, and I can get to thank Alan for that. <laughs> um, we all do. Um, and, and now, uh, I'll, a, a, another version of the fictional technique, uh, Willie Stark, who most people know, the protagonist of this epic novel, All the King's Men, if you don't know, you should, is uh, Huey Long, the governor of, the then governor of uh, Louisiana in the 20s and 30s. A very extraordinary figure. And um, this piece is taken, is the first, we've seen Willie Stark, who is a stand-in for Huey Long, um, but this is the first time he takes stage. This is, this is how um, Penn Warren introduces him. He's in a small Louisiana town, and his son and, and those people are all around, and this is introduced with, it's Willie, exclamation point. The boss kept walking straight ahead. 
His head bowed a little, the way a man bows his head when he's out walking by himself and has something on his mind. His hair fell down over his forehead, for he was carrying his hat in his hand. I knew his hair was down over his forehead, for I saw him give his head a quick jerk once or twice, the way he always did when he was walking alone, and it fell down toward his eyes, the kind of motion a horse gives just after the bit is in, and he's full of beans. He walked straight across the street and across a patch of grass and up the steps to, of the courthouse. Nobody else followed him up the steps. At the top, he turned around slow to face the crowd. He simply looked at them, blinking his eyes a little, just as though he had just stepped out of the open doors and the dark hall of the courthouse behind him and was blinking to get his eyes adjusted to the light. He stood up there blinking, the hair down on his forehead and the dark sweat patch showing under each arm of his Palm Beach coat. Then he gave his head a twitch. His eyes bulged wide open, even if the light was hitting him full in the face and you could see the glitter in them. It's coming, I thought. Now, this is a first person narrative. This is being narrated by one of um, Willie Stark's aides. Uh, and this is a great American tradition, going back to a book I'm going to talk about a little later, um, Moby Dick. And, and Melville took that from others. I mean, it's not, he didn't invent it. But um, Willie Stark versus Huey Long. If you go and get one of the great American biographies, T. Harry Williams, Huey Long which was a landmark in, in many ways in his geography. I would suggest that you will see that the real Huey Long really was more like a figure out of Gabriel Garcia Marquez or Mar Mario Vargas Llosa or Carlos Fuentes or Isabel Allende. He was improbable. He was, it was a combination of luck. He was much more ignoble than Willie Stark is in this great novel. Um, there was so much about what he wanted to do that should not have worked had he not been assassinated on the steps of the Baton Rouge Capitol. Um, he may have well become president of the United States and, you know, been an alternate reality. <laughs> um, but Pin Warren actually makes his character much more reasonable, much more in line with an epic hero. Um, and in many ways, that's the Huey Long we actually remember, the kingfish. Um, if we had world, en world enough in time, I would talk at length about both Mitchell and Pen Warren and all the devices they use. How very like Joseph Mitchell, Jack Burden, the narrator of All the King's Men is. How the tones of these narrators affect the reader's view of the character. How dialogue, think about how Mitchell, uh, how um, Ghoul, that, that, that's one of Mitchell's most quoted lines, the one longer as the has been. Um, is, is the chief, dialogue is the chief weapon of characterization, if deployed over and over again, slyly and with force, and how action, think of Stark's theater of stump speaking, or the minutia of Ghoul asking for the cup of tomato soup, are both deliberate, chosen, and illuminating of character. Moreover, both Mitchell and Penn Warren are first and last storytellers. They never forget the main thrust of their story. What does your character want? In the case of Joe Gould, it is to obscure the fact that his great idea, the oral history, and a lot of people don't know that we get the term oral history from Joseph Mitchell and Joe Gould. I mean, we had oral histories, but that term comes from his work, was never completed. And in the case of Willie Stark, he simply wishes to become president of the United States. Mitchell and Penn Warren use how other characters view their main subject. They flirt and subvert st stereotype. I mean, you think of this homeless bum on the streets of New York who pals around with E.E. E. Cummings and Ezra Pound and this becomes a darling of all this, of the high society folk. Um, the mental baggage we all bring along with us, they exploit the unpredictable and ultimately, they give us the Aristotelian moment of discovery, learning, changing. And they are also aware of the fact that some people just don't change. They use place, the sense of place, ruthlessly and with great art. In the case of Mitchell, it is New York. It is always New York, always a character in his writing. 
And in the case of Penn Warren, it is the entire state of Louisiana. He lived and taught in Baton Rouge and traveled the state when he was researching this, this book. A Love Letter to a Landscape. This, of course, you realize is witchcraft. And witchcraft can be black or white. Both fiction and nonfiction are made things. Writers, above all, must always be mindful of this bedrock truth. Stories are made. Consider three stories, three powerful stories from our, our cultural, our shared cultural history. And I, these, these, I look at that list I gave you all and I just real, I'm just revealing myself. I'm still a 13 year old boy. Um, Robinson Crusoe, Moby Dick, and Mutiny on the Bounty. In the case of Alexander Selkirk, he did exist. He was the man, he was there, he suffered. He was a Scotsman who was cast away on a deserted island in the Pacific in 1703, just a few days ago. And finally rescued in 1709. I know you love that. What's that Tom Hanks movie? Castaway, yeah, well that was, that was the story. Um, years later, several accounts, including accounts written by Selkirk were published. But we remember Daniel Defoe's 19, 1719 novel, The Life and Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe Best. In, many, in, in fact, many people believe he was actually the fellow. Why is that? Why do we remember a made up character more than we remember the real dude? <laughs> and speaking, and I have to mention this, in the case of Defoe and the new journalist, he, play, he was playing fast and loose in the 18th century with conventions that today, you know, would get him kicked out of the press club. One of my favorite stories is, uh, and he was always on the, on the side of the angels. He was, you know, against, you know, capital punishment and this, that, and the other. And there was this guy who he thought was wrongly accused, who was going to the gallows, and he was leaving behind a family, and Defoe wanted to help the family out. So he, 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 he had the guy sell him the rights to his story. The guy's like, he was illiterate. Um, and he gave the money to the family. And what he did was he marched into, made a big show of marching into the prison to collect the manuscript, which was in his bag. <laughs> and he walks out and he displays this manuscript from this wrongly convicted man that he's gonna publish. And um, uh, he, was, he, was quite, he was quite a, a devil. A lot of people think that his Journal of the Plague Year is journalism. And not, and he kind of promoted it as journalism. It's a novel. It was all made up. He was he wasn't even born during the plague. Henry, Henry Herman Melville spent many years at sea as a whaler, so it makes sense that he would undertake to transmute the 1821 narrative of the most extraordinary and distressing shipwreck of the whale ship Essex. I love that title into his 1851 masterpiece that nobody read at the time. It was, it was a failure. You guys know Moby Dick didn't, didn't sell. Owen Chase was the first mate and one of the eight survivors. I mean, it's an extraordinary story. His book was out of print by the time Melville got around to writing Moby Dick. So why do we remember Moby Dick and Ahab and Ishmael and not until very, very recently with the publication of Nathaniel Philbrick's book and Ron Howard's movie version, which I recommend because it's one of the few movie versions that actually gets to what the harvesting of whales was actually, I mean, how horrible it was, how much courage you had to have to get into those little boats and go out to get that great big whale and then carve it up and they put little boys in there. To, yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> um, but why did, why for over a hundred years did we think about Moby Dick. I mean, it's a great story. And think of what Melville did. Uh, and I mean, the, the Essex, uh, the, the, the horror of the Essex was human folly, incompetence, and this rogue whale that only until recently marine biologists said couldn't exist, that a sperm whale could actually take vengeance, be out, you know, to kill somebody on purpose. Now we, it's not as far-fetched as it seemed then. Um, but 
Melville took this story of happenstance. I mean, it was a great story, but what did it mean? He gave it meaning. He gave us Ahab and his vengeance. He gave us his, the spirit of the, of the whale. Uh, he gave us Ishmael, the narrator, um, who, again, was a, a ancestor of Jack Burden and, and Joseph Mitchell. And then there's Mutiny on the Bounty. Back in the day when there were only three stations and it was black and white. I remember on Saturday when they would show these old movies, remember that? Charles Lawton with his great big lips and those eyes as Captain Bly, you know. Poor Captain Bly, he was a SOB, but he was a complicated SOB. I had no idea that there was actually a Captain Bly and the story of the bounty and that mutiny was, was, was I mean, there have been at least three movies, and I think there's another one in the works. Um, there was a Captain Bly, there was a Christopher Fletcher, there was the Pitcairn Island crew. And why does it resonate so much? Because it's about empire, it's about the rights of, of, of men and women, or in that case, men, freedom, free will, um, adventure, all of those things. Do you guys know Herman Woke is still alive? He's like 101. And he freely admits that the Cain mutiny, you know, is based on, it, it gets its structure from um, this story told uh, back in the, in the 18th century. Um, there is so much desire, anxiety today, primarily from writers and lovers of fiction over the newfound popularity of nonfiction. People worry that, by and by, the writers of nonfiction will supplant centrally, centrally longed, hallowed grounds of novels and short stories. I submit to you that storytelling is older than Samuel Richardson and Lady Murasaki's Tale of the Genji. I submit to you that the atoms of storytelling are essentially the same and that ultimately, if well done, the story itself, even greater than the original flesh and blood, will live on. And if it's told right, it holds some nugget of truth. The truth, reality, actuality. I'm reminded of Mark Twain's advice, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> I think it is important in this era in which our leaders launch such incendiary accusations as fake news about so carelessly that it is only responsible to pick apart this notion of reality versus truth. Philosophers make a distinction between reality and actuality. Reality is what we can measure, that which can be supported by evidence. Actuality is the more intangible truth. I point to the masterful biography of George Bernard Shaw by Michael Holyrood. It's four volumes long. Holyrood is a supreme scholar, and there's not a word in that volume that goes unsupported. And yet there is the man, George Bernard Shaw, and all we do not and cannot know about him. There is the real Bernard Shaw, and there is the actual George Bernard Shaw. Neither one is fake. Writing about real people is always fought, fraught with ethical problems, especially when a writer dares to take an actual flesh and blood person into the realm of fiction. I point to the aforementioned All the King's Men, or we could look at the countless novels from Anthony Burgess's novel of Shakespeare, Nothing Like the Sun, or William Styron's controversial Confessions of Nat Turner. Um, there is stretching the truth and there is lying. I quickly add here that I am not advocating for lying. Rather, I am pointing out that good storytelling, proper myth-making, employs techniques and methods that go beyond mere reportage. That the quality and care, not only to attention, but to creation of character, but care and feeding of story, go beyond just the facts. That the very woof and weave of narrative going into the formation of mythology, wise storytellers are always aware of this. Call it manipulation, if you will. Call it fabrication. To fabricate means to make, not to lie. How many of you know the name Margaret Garner? OK. So for those of you who don't, uh, she, OK. OK, good. For those of you who don't, she was uh, a slave woman who, in, who escaped from a, 
a plantation in Kentucky wound up across the Ohio River. Um, and when the patrollers came to take her ch and her children back down to Kentucky, she chose to kill her children rather than to allow them to go back into that peculiar institution, as they called it. A young editor at Random House who's developing an anthology of sort of am omnum gatherum of black history read that story for the first time and it stuck in her imagination. Less than 20 years later, she wrote a novel called Beloved based on that story. And I, I, I am fascinated by the fact that Margaret Warner's story was actually darker than Beloved, as, as mystical it was, because she wound up taking her own life. She jumped from a ship into the Ohio River, took her own life. Um, and so Morrison at once was honors her story, um, but can't quite approximate the actuality of it. And in many ways, the magic of that book does address, address that. So I leave you with this paradox to ponder. Character is more than the sum of the parts, and yet you get no character without knowing all the various and sundry parts. You can't leap over those constituent ingredients, and yet the making of a woman or a man on the page transcends that catalog. That is the rub. I was looking at Nabokov's lectures. He did this, like four books he did while at Cornell, or four collections of lectures as Nabokov on Don Quixote, Nabokov on Russian literature. Um, and the one, the one I'm thinking about is Nabokov on literature. In the epigram, he, and this is very convenient, he says that fiction writer's job are the three E's. He doesn't say the three E's, that sounds too, you know. But he says, educate, entertain, and enchant. Everybody wants to ed entertain, educate me. You know, that's, that's, we talk about that in workshop. Everybody's always trying to tell me stuff. Um, entertaining, that's a little, it's a little harder to be entertaining. It takes a little finesse and sense of audience, but enchant. What is Nabokov trying to get at when he admonishes us to enchant our reader? The danger today of nonfiction supplanting fiction, the anxiety of the reification of the real over the imagination, I do not share that anxiety. Though I, I recognize a lot of nonfiction writers are out writing a lot of fiction writers these days. I think what happened is that in the wake of the aforementioned new journalism crest in the 1960s, writers like John McPhee discovered how to mythologize places like the Pine Barrens, learned from Joseph Mitchell how to make the truth rise up to mythic proportions, how to make fishermen and truck drivers and grocers loom in the imagination the way warriors and holy grail chasers once did. I think some fiction writers abdicated their birthright and got lost in the weeds of literalism and quotidian facts and burdensome logic and lost sight of those things about the human condition that most excite our imagination. Mystery, the intangible, the mess of it all, the human spirit. But that's just a theory, I don't know. I just believe in imagination. Thank you. Thank you for coming.